Now, of course, it's a great uh, joy and privilege to be with you once again. And uh, I've heard from among you even uh, this night uh, some things that I felt like we ought to uh, say formally so that they would be well uh, said and remembered. Uh, we've just had a lot of bad weather down in Texas, and uh, one of the storms uh, went across our property and uh, uprooted two real big trees, big trees. And one of them was uh, right at the edge of the of the water. We have a pond, and the water was rather deep there, and the tree was, uh, a lot of the root was down in, in the water. And so I got the tree out, finally pulled it all. It's about 60 foot tall. But I uh, got it all out, but I couldn't get the stump out. And about the time I was yanking and pulling on that stump, uh, Frank called from uh, Yakima. And uh, my first reaction was, oh, I can't really talk to Frank right now. I'm so busy. But uh, the Spirit reminded me of something. The Spirit said, uh, who's doing this work? And I said, well, it's Christ as me. And the Holy Spirit said, uh, what is Christ doing? Uh, he's pulling up a stump, if you're going to look at it like that. But more so, the Holy Spirit said Christ <coughs> is in agreement and oneness with the Father. And said the pulling up of the stump is a way that Christ honors and recognizes and worships the Father. And so I ran, grabbed the, the phone, and uh, had a good conversation with uh, Frank because I realized something, that what I was doing was a form of worship, that I was not separated from the Christ that was in me pulling up the stump. And I would have had time to talk to Frank, uh, my dear brother, if I was in a worship service somewhere and Frank asked me something, I'd, of course, speak to him. Or if we were driving down the road, I'd speak to him. And I thought everything we do, therefore, as Christ, is Christ laboring under the Father, and therefore it's a form of worship. Your labor, your work is a form of worship. And what I found out in this walk with the Lord is that I never judge people. The keystone to this message has been 2 Corinthians 5 and 16. That's what jars people. That, that's, that's a keystone to this message. That's a, a cornerstone that holds it. Uh, we started out in this to see no man in the flesh. And I've tried to stay true to that as best I could. I have this feeling once in a while, I'd like to know how those folks are moving along. I'd like to know what they're thinking, why don't they say something, why don't they talk. But I've learned a few years ago in this message to not press that. Because I found out first I'd get people to say something that wasn't so. Because they wanted to please me and wanted everybody to think that they were okay. So I left it to them. Because I found out that some people worship God not by what they say, not in testimony, not in what we've always thought was a witness, but their witness is in labor. My worship, I took what I was doing that day in cleaning up that big old tree as a form of worship. And I did it as under the Father. You remember Jesus said something one time about helping others he said, when you've done it under the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. Well, I learned something years ago when I was in rehabilitation work, and it was in the Lord's work, but we had, a, we had an alcoholic home, a place where we took in drunks and drug addicts and so forth, and, and it was a very discouraging work. We had a few victories along the way, but uh, most of the time uh, we poured our life into somebody and didn't get anything out of them. And always when they left, they took a TV or the silverware or whatever they get their hands on because they need to go get uh, another drink or another fix somewhere, and so they just used us. And uh, made you kind of feel like, well, you're not doing these people much good. Uh, maybe you help one out of a dozen, but look at the life you poured into the other 11 and got nothing out of it. And then it was that the Lord brought that scripture to me. We shouldn't be serving alcoholics. 
We shouldn't be serving drug addicts. That's our mistake, serving them. Whatever we pour into them should be a service unto the Lord. We should make them Christ and serve them. And then nothing is lost. Nothing is lost. See, that's a form of worship. Whatever you do, do it as under the Lord. I hear somebody talk and say, well, I got an old car. I just can't keep it fixed up. I'm having to work on it all the time. Turn your attitude around, your thinking, and make the serving of God the fiction of that car, that it's a form of worship. So I'll do it in a better spirit. I'll do it with love. I'll do it with kindness. Now, there are some of you in this room who will never be preachers or missionaries or teachers or big talkers, but you worship God. You're a witness. Like Robbie says, she can, she's blessed by your witness, like Mary. So Mary doesn't have to be a big talker. I make mention to Robbie all the time about uh, Gloria. I don't hear Gloria saying a whole lot. But I see Gloria worshiping God. To me, that's the worship of God, what Gloria does. She does that sweetly and kindly to take care of all these people. She prepares food. She keeps the house. She works a job right along with it outside. She does. To me, that's a form of worship. I'm not going to be separated from the Lord. In that. If there's something I must do, even something I don't like. I don't like to do plumbing. Sometimes when I'm home, I have to do plumbing because I'm no plumber and I don't know the na I don't have the knack and I don't know the tricks to plumbing. But I always have to fix a pipe. Well, I've decided that's a high form of worship for me. Some of you like to stand in a meeting and clap your hands and jump up and down or dance a little bit in the spirit. Well, my highest form of worship is plumbing <laughs> because that's Christ as me honoring the Father. So don't separate yourself. And, and the big danger we have when we start wondering if people are growing is that then we become fruit inspectors. And we, we put, a, we put a, a, a cleavage between us because we kind of wait for them to catch up with us. I was blessed again uh, yesterday, day before, or at least yesterday. Uh, a lot of you... Uh, heard me talk about the class down in California. Since you're getting to know them, I'll not pick out individuals uh, too much anymore. But that was a real raunchy class when we started. I mean, some of them that were gung-ho to hear what I had to say were drug addicts. Uh, they were alcoholics. A number of them were alcoholics. Uh, Christian science had strong Christian science and Eastern religion in that class. It was a strong class uh, when we when we first began, and has been all the way along. And one of them stood yesterday in the meeting and said, we're so thankful that when, when we had all these problems, you didn't force us to do something. Because it kind of got loose yesterday. Uh, we gave an award to one of them, a go-giver award, who had been uh, very faithful to this fellowship. And through the, for five years, five years, we've never missed a month in the Bay Area, in San Francisco. And uh, they got to talking about that, and one of them stood up and said, well, uh, for five years, you've never pressed us, never forced us. And that, is, that isn't me. To me, that's what Christ is. Now, I came out of a religion that wanted to know where you was, wanted evidence, wanted proof. But I don't demand that anymore. If you tell me you're born again, then your objective in life is to grow in that relationship you have with God. And who among us can tell you where you're growing? I've seen the weakest be strong in a crisis. I've seen the strongest fall apart in a crisis. It's really the crisis that makes the difference in our life, and God allows those things to come. So we don't really want to inspect and, and try to get others to prove where they are in the Lord. Uh, I had a wedding in California this Saturday, and I had two or three fellows there that pressed me. Uh, you know, they were the zealous uh, witnessing type uh, people out of a, I guess, charismatic church, and they were really wanting to push me in a corner and tell me what it was they believed. And 
Uh, one of them had read, read one of my books, so he felt like he had a camaraderie with me of some sort. And you know what I did? I treated them as if Christ was in I stood there and listened to things I didn't have the slightest interest in or even belief in. I didn't even believe it. But it wasn't my place to correct them. You know why I didn't correct them? Because I couldn't lay a proper foundation for what I was going to say. See? So I didn't correct them. I agreed with them. And, and if we ever meet again, they'll not think, well, he's a bad fellow. They'll think, well, I had him one time in a corner and he really listened to me. I'll get him there again. Uh, maybe someday they can be in a meeting where a foundation is laid. You know what I've told you about witnessing and, and uh, about other people is that uh, you don't cast pearl before swine, and not that our message is greater or better than any other, but the Christ life message is a message that needs the foundation. So you say to somebody, if, they're, if you think they're hungry or want to know about the Lord, uh, let, me, let me have some time with you and explain to you what we're saying. Because if you don't take time with people and lay a foundation, and you know what I mean by that. Go back to the three prime texts. Go back to the number one doctrinal statement in the scripture, the in Christ message. Go back to those simple things which they'll all nod their heads and say, yeah, yeah, I can see that. But lay your foundation and then build on it. Don't answer their far off questions. Uh, somebody comes to me, uh, well, it did this Saturday. A fellow said, uh, uh, explain to me what you mean by the division of soul and spirit. And so I just hum hauled around because it would take me a good hour to lay a foundation to answer that question. Well, he didn't want my answer anyhow. What he wanted to do was to create the platform for what he thought soul was. And so I listened to him about 15 minutes rattle about what a soul was and how, how the souls are going to go to hell and how there's going to be a change in the banking system in the United States. I mean, he had it all wrapped up in a lot of strange things. I just listened to him, agreed with him, and loved him because I knew Christ was in him. But that was no time and place for me to say what I had to say. When I got through, I said, I hope you'll read uh, one of my books. I think it'll help you. And the fellow that got married has all our books at his disposal. They were friends of his, so he could get them to us. Now, you see what I'm saying? We're lambs, but we're lambs led to a slaughter. We're lambs before our accusers, at times, we have to stand dumb and open not our mouth. So may the Lord uh, challenge you that, uh, that we are one, not because we've all reached a certain position, and I guess I'll talk about that for a moment, because I've been at this for a long time. Since 1960, I've been dealing with people in deep commitment. And I suppose I've had, without exaggeration, hundreds of young men who have followed me in uh, one part of this message or another that has to do with commitment. And one fault they all had was pressuring people to make proof of who and what they were. And if there's one thing I ever tried to do was to steer them away from that, because I came up in religion that was, that was always classifying saints. Classifying. I came up in the holiness church, and in the holiness church, uh, they demand this kind of proof. Uh, uh, getting saved don't mean anything. That just means now you're ready to seek for sanctification. Getting sanctified don't mean anything because you haven't talked in tongues yet. Talking in tongues don't mean anything until you get all of your life wrapped up in what it is as church doctrine. So they kept classifying people. I grew up with people who believed that the only ones that were going to go meet the Lord in the rapture were the ones that talked in tongues. Well, that was a classification they put on people. And you know what we did? We got people to meet that classification right and left because they didn't want to go to hell. They wanted to go up in the rapture, but it wasn't real. It was like a law. We said, you believe this law, you practice this law, but the law didn't bless them, it killed them. And I think the church is like that. I think there are multitudes of people talking in tongues that have done just as little for God if they had never heard of talking in tongues. Because that's not the issue, you see. But we want to get people to a proof and to an evidence. And so uh, in the Christ life, we look at that a little differently. I'm content to go along. I'm not looking for a bunch of people to 
uh, get up and uh, jump up and down. Uh, we are the Christ life. We are the Christ life. I, I, it's just not in me to do that. But it is in me to lay this word out and let people take a hold of it as they see it and live it as it works through them. You see? And the more you hear it, the more you'll work it out of you. You'll work out your salvation. You'll work Christ out of you. That's what it means. You'll work him out. By your mind, you begin to see the ways and means by which you work Christ out of you. Well, uh, I think I heard Frank say it a little earlier about what a radical change there is in our worship, the way we worship. Well, my very job is worship. Somebody said to me, that, how do you make all these long trips? It's a form of worship to me. I'm worshiping God in there. That's my worship. I grew up where you had to have a 30-minute, an hour song service, and every piece in the orchestra uh, going and, and a big choir and everybody shouting and hollering or you didn't feel like you'd been to church. But that was to bring Christ to you, to get you in touch with Christ. But when the revelation came that Christ is in you, while all that's wonderful and good and we like to do it, and I'm certainly not against doing it, that wasn't the means by which I worship Christ in spirit and in truth anymore. You remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? He said to the woman of the well, the day's going to come when you won't worship in this place anymore because the, 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 the people at that time, the, the, the Judaizers and the, the proselytes to Judaism, believed there had to be a specific place that you went to to worship God, like, uh, like uh, Israel does today. You've got to go to the land of Israel. The, the uh, Mormons, uh, are not Mormons, but well, the Mormons uh, go to Salt Lake City for their highest uh, right of the church to be applied. Uh, Muslims, Muslims all go to, the, uh, to their Mecca. Uh, and the Jews believe that, that you went to a place. He said, no, the day is coming when we're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Now, are you ready to let others do that? You see, I think Christ needs to work through everything we're doing. I think we need to bring Christ into everything we're doing. Not that we announce to people Christ is here, but that in our own thinking, this is Christ is me doing. Whatever the menial task is, whatever the job is, no separation in your mind from the Christ who is your life. See? And once you get a hold of that, then it, the next step is to make it a form of worship. Well, I'll do this. I'll do this gladly. I'll do it in joy. I won't grumble. I won't complain. I won't gripe about it. I won't talk about how hard it is. I'll worship my Father because this is Christ as me performing. Jesus said, I can do nothing aside from my Father. And he said, all things I do I do as under the Father. Well, you see, we got some growing to do there because we need to make everything we're doing as under the Father. Two things will happen when you make everything you do a form of worship. First thing is you'll do what you're doing better. You'll do the job better. Second, you'll do it sweeter. I mean, the salesman will make his sales better if he realizes this is Christ on on this job, this is Christ making this sale. This is Christ as me talking to these people. And once that idea grips him, you know what'll, what'll happen? He'll be much sweeter. When are they going to see Jesus? When we do it better and we're sweeter. They'll see Christ. Because they know what a raunchy old world this is. And if you and I can't overcome this world by Christ in us, nobody can. Because Jesus is the only one who said, I've overcome this world. Well, that isn't easy, is it? I tell you, I don't do that perfect myself. But I'm learning. I'm learning. And, and if I had one thing to say in this, in this matter, it would be make everything you do worship unto God. Worship God. Worship God. To, to realize that it's Christ at you serving the Father. And remember, Jesus says, Father, I do nothing of myself. I do it all unto you. Well, that's, that's a form of worship. Now, if you can't do it as unto the Father, don't do it. See? 
The reason why the world can't tell the difference between a Christian and themselves is because we're doing a whole lot of things we probably ought not to do. We can't do them better, and we can't do them sweetly. And the world sees that. Well, what's the difference between you? you, you don't, you're not so hot. You're not on time. Uh, you didn't do a better job than the rest of us. Uh, uh, I see you're downcast. You're blue. You're angry. You get mad. What's the difference between you and me? So the Christ in you is always given to the Father. He said, the Father and I are one. Therefore, I do nothing of myself. So pick up that little job you got and do it as under the Lord. And if you can't do it, just say, Father, don't believe I want to do this. Can't do it right. I'm not going to do it. Well, now that'll burn somebody up. But if you have to do it, do it as under the Lord. Your job, your family responsibility, there's a lot of things you have to do. Well, one of the biggest uh, problems I guess we have in our understanding of the Lord is how to live the new life. And we are ready now on this, uh, in this session to talk about the new man. In Romans 5, we talked about the one man. In Romans 6, we talked about the old man. Romans 7, we talked about the dead man. And now in Romans 8, we're ready to talk about the new man. The new man. The new man in Christ Jesus. Now, I have to confess to you that Romans 8 is so deep, I've never gotten near the depth of it. It reaches such heights I've never ascended to it full understanding. Romans 8 is not only precious, it is deep, it is magnificent, and I think we'll be studying Romans 8 when we get to heaven. Now, I said the same thing about Ephesians 1, so I'll say the same thing about Romans 8. I don't know all there is in Ephesians 1, and it's less than half the size of Romans 8 in content. But Romans 8 is full and exhausting, and we're certainly not going to be able to touch every aspect of Romans 8 in this institute, but we are going to look at various parts of it. And you can't hardly start the chapter and get into it at all without just stopping at verse 1. Verse 1 of Romans 8 really doesn't belong in Romans 8. Now, if the fellows who translated this Bible had been Christ-like believers, they wouldn't have done what they did. They would have left Romans 8 and 1 as 7 and 26, because that's where it belongs. It belongs at least as the last verse of the 7th chapter. Uh, maybe there ought not to be a break anywhere between Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8. But the fact is, there he is, that break, and we can't just go into Romans 8 without discussing Romans 8 and 1. We talked about Romans 8 and 1 from two or three different viewpoints. When we talked about justification, we had to include Romans, uh, I'm sorry, Romans 8 and 1. We had to include uh, in that the now generation. There is therefore now and, and you should have that circled if you went through previous institute because that's one of the strongest now verses. There is no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. It has a strong in Christ statement, and it has the statement that they walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, that takes us into a whole different world, that last line, and we'll reserve that to the rest of the study of Romans 8. But just for the time, let's talk about the fact of no condemnation because even though we have mentioned it time and again probably in, inter, in institute, we must bear witness to it again. A believer in Christ Jesus who knows he's in Christ Jesus. Now you have to read that verse like that. There is, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who know. Now, if you don't write that in there, you don't get the full meaning of the verse. So that's a little word left out. Who know they're in Christ Jesus. 
Uh, why do I stress that? Because it's very obvious that multitudes of believers who are in Christ Jesus, birthed by God, still have guilt and condemnation. So certainly, the intent of Paul was not to leave us that there's no such thing as guilt and condemnation just because you're saved. Fact is, there is guilt and condemnation, even though you're saved, but the reason there is, is because you don't know something. Throw back to Romans 6, the foreknowing. You don't know something, so you live in guilt and condemnation. Now, we've talked about the cycle of guilt. Guilt is like a cycle. I've explained that to you before when I talked about addiction, for instance. An alcoholic drinks. He gets in trouble. He hurts people because he drinks and that makes him feel guilty. Then because he is guilty, he wants to punish himself. All guilt wants to be punished. I feel so bad, I feel so blue, I feel so discouraged, I want to do something bad. So the worst thing he can think of doing is drinking. So here he is in the cycle. He drinks, he feels bad because he's drink. He gets guilty because he feels bad. He punishes guilt by drinking again. And so the cycle is started. He can't get free of it. It's a thing of the mind. He is fixed in his mind that he can't get free of that. You know, a great number of people who, use, uh, who smoke cigarettes are bound in their mind by that same thing. They know they shouldn't do it. They don't want to do it. And how do they punish that guilt? By turning around doing it again. It's like a hopeless cycle. And one of the most difficult things we've ever had in Christianity for, for Christians to be free of is tobacco, smoking. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that if you smoke, you're going to go to hell or you're not saved. I don't believe that at all. I believe a lot of Christians who, who are saved do smoke, and some of them have habits. Uh, I think God saved them. God loved them, and they still have these body pulls, and they need to be free of them and will be free if they go on in the Lord. But if they stagnate at any place, if they stop at any place in their growth, then they won't have power to bring flesh under subjection, their bodies under subjection. And so they'll belabor this thing. And I've known believers that belabored it for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. They're where they went. Somebody prayed for them that they'd stop smoking. But the problem's in their mind. Because what they're doing is, is doing something that the body pulls wants them to do, the flesh. And then when they do it, they feel bad about it. Oh, I wish I didn't smoke. Saw a commercial, and it said, uh, 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 people get cancer from smoking. Oh, I don't want to smoke. I wish I didn't smoke. I wish I didn't have these devil things. I've heard people curse the very cigarette. What was that? That was guilt. They felt bad because they did it. Well, then it's in the human being to punish guilt. How do they punish it? Smoke another cigarette. They punished their guilt. We heard on the news today, uh, only 4,000 people nationally last year died from drugs. Now think of it. 4,000 died from cocaine and drugs in the United States. You know how many died from tobacco smoking? 500,000. Now that wasn't a case against drugs. Drugs is the big enemy right now. But you know, nobody's saying say no to smoking. Nobody's fighting tobacco. And yet, you can't even compare those statistics, 4,000 to 500,000. I mean, you're in the umpteenth thousandth of a percentage. And yet, we're all talking about drugs, but nobody's talking about a bigger enemy. Now, what is my point? Guilt and condemnation have got to be faced. It's a thing in human beings. It's what Romans 7 talked about. The things I want to do, I can't do, and the things I don't want to do, I do all the time. The guilt comes because there is not within self, the human being, the power to stop doing what it is that hurts you. Now, are you with me? It is not in the human being the power to cease from sin themselves. It isn't in them to cease from being angry or hateful or bitter. I was gripped with this thought this past month and it got a little uh, sermonette on the front page of Wagon's Hole this time. It is possible for any Christ-like believer to commit any awful sin listed in Romans 3 or Galatians 5. 
any believer could commit any one of those awful sins, sex sins or even murder. Why? The possibility is within us because it is not in us to do right within ourselves. If it was possible for the human being to do right, then God made a colossal error in creation when he said, I'll put my spirit in them. I'll put them in Christ. That wasn't a mistake. That was pure logic because God knew he could not create a free moral agent who had the power within themselves to cease from sin and doing wrong. And that's why we have so much law in the church today, because the church doesn't know that in general. Doesn't know that. People don't realize that today. So the church says, Here's the law, you better not do it. And so everybody is all tensed up to stop doing something bad, some evil, some sin. A fellow said to me one time, why do you think the church has such awful blow-ups? Now, I don't know, you, you may not have them in Washington, but I tell you we have them in Texas, and especially Arkansas. Because people take their religion dead serious there and sometimes you have a blow up that is unbelievable i preached at a church one time when i was in my denomination i preached at a church one time where god gave a great revival and performed a great miracle because just a few months before in that church they'd had a business meeting where the sheriff's department had to come out and take charge of it. <laughs> why two sides in the church and they had brought guns and they had fist fights right in the church house. And if the sheriff hadn't been there, they'd have killed each other. I mean, they took their religion serious. Somebody said to me, how could Christians do this? How in the world could good people come to such an end? Now, you've seen it, haven't you? have seen people go to court, they'd get mad, they wouldn't speak for years, right in God's house. I mean, people who should have been born again. How can an awful thing like that happen? It's simple. They tried to cure the sin in their life themselves. They laid down a law. They preached a doctrine, and they said, do this. Don't do that. And the end result was they're built up in them like a great pressure, a force where they were trying to do right, trying to do what was right. You ever seen anybody grit their teeth and say, I'm trying to do what's right? That wasn't the way God made us. And when human beings try to do what was right and try to not do what is evil, a pressure builds up and they blow up. They blow up. Why do preachers go wrong, So, I mean, good men who are really men of God, why do they go wrong? Because the pressure builds up from them trying to do right and trying not to do evil. Well, you say, shouldn't we do what is right and not do evil? Not us. Him. Him. I can't do it. I can't quit my sinning. I must have a will to not sin, but I cannot quit my sinning. Because the only power I have is Christ. If I don't see that Christ is in me and I'm in Christ, I cannot overcome. Who is the overcomer? Christ, not me. There is no power in me. It's when I say, okay, I'm a miserable mess. I fail. I'm a sinner. I'm no count. Jesus, it's up to you. For the first time, the power begins to flow. That's the power that's in a believer because he senses Jesus can do it. I can't do it. Christ can do it. That's why believers blow up. That's why churches blow up like that. It's because that pressure builds from them attempting to keep a law <clears throat> and do what is right and not do evil that they absolutely explode at a point. And awful things take place. Well, the verse that we're dealing with says, now there is no condemnation to those who know they're in Christ Jesus. 
Now, <clears throat> we need to invert that statement a bit because every place it says in Christ, it not only means you're in Christ, but it means Christ is in you. That's an inseparable union. You understand that? And remember our little colloquialism or phrase is you can't put a sock in the water without the water being in the sock. Okay? You can't put a believer in Christ without Christ being in the believer. You can't separate them at that point. There is no separation at that point. So every believer that's in Christ has Christ in him. He doesn't know that. If he doesn't know that, then he's going to try to live a good life like Christ. He's going to try to be like Christ. He's going to try to do what Christ said to do. He's going to try to live where Christ said to live. And he'll fail because he has reached outside of himself to try to be like Christ when only the Christ in him, working through him, can make him acceptable to God because that was God's plan. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, He's a new creation. But if he doesn't know that he's in Christ, then he's going to be bound by guilt. If any man knows he's in Christ, there is no guilt or condemnation. Now that's more or less the positive side of guilt and condemnation, being in Christ and Christ being in you. But so that you'll never forget this, I want to tell you a little story. You may have heard it before, but bear with me again because it fits in this verse to help you remember it. If you attempt to fight guilt and condemnation on your own, you're going to be defeated. For that's Satan's biggest play in your life, guilt and condemnation. <clears throat> that's where Satan has his foot in the door more than any other thing in your life, guilt and condemnation. And let me explain to you how it works. One day when I was a counselor, one evening about five o'clock when I was getting, in fact, was closing up my office, I looked out in the hallway and there's a big group of people. So I asked someone there, what is it I can do for you? They said, it is imperative. We must speak to you. And so I brought them into my office, must have been 20 or more of them. And standing in the midst of them was a little lady, I'd say 28, 32 years of age. She hadn't combed her hair in days. She had on a gingham dress and it was splotched with blood. She stood there, and I recognized immediately that she was in a, a uh, near comatose state. She looked right at me and never saw me, and I knew she didn't see me, or did she know anything going on in that room. And so the spokesman said, uh, we are a family. We've all come together, even from out of town, because of our sister who's in this condition, and said, we have to have help. Said she has been in Parkland Hospital. Uh, we took her over there, and they sedated her because she's tried to take her life in the last uh, 24 hours. But uh, they said, uh, after they sedated her, that it'd be okay if we took her own home. But said, we need God's help, and we need the help of a professional person who can handle this kind of situation. So we were told to come to you. And uh, we need help desperately. Well, I said, what in the world's happened to her? And so the man doing the talking told me this story. He said it began several years ago, as best we can figure. That we go to a Baptist church, she goes to a Baptist church, and says so she's born again, and she really loves God. But she got involved in the church right after she was first married with a worker in the church. I don't know whether the minister or somebody on staff or who it was, but said she got to work in the church and got involved with somebody on staff, and she had an affair with him. That it was brief, fleeting, 
and said she's, she's quickly stopped it, but she had an affair. And she, he said as the years has gone by, this thing has been pretty well submerged. And said she would go to church, and once in a while the subject would come up in the preaching or somewhere, and it would upset her about this thing she had done, but said she loved God, and she didn't want to hurt her husband or tell anybody else, so she just submerged it. Actually, that was all right for your information. She should have done that. But she should have had a way and a means of laying that off on Christ and his sacrifice at the cross. Because to have told it would have hurt many other people. And if she could bear that thing along and turn it over to Jesus and go on, she'd have been a whole lot better off. But she didn't have that ability to to dump it on the Lord, so she carried it herself. And every once in a while, it would rise up within her. And the man, uh, a brother of hers, doing the talking said, obviously, a few months ago, she was in church, and something triggered this thing in her, and she decided she had to dump it because it had just welled up in her, and she couldn't turn it over to the Lord. So when she left church that morning, she asked the preacher if she could have an appointment with him. He said, sure. And so she went in the next morning, sat down in his office, and poured out the whole story. Well, the preacher was wise. He said, now, I'm glad you told me. He said, it, it's good that you get it out. And uh, he had prayer with her and asked God to take care of it and asked her if she believed, yes, I believe. Now, he said, there's no need to tell your husband to upset people. We've turned it over to God, and there's no sense to destroy any other lives. And she had children by then. And so she walked out free for the time. But a few days went by, and the thing hit her again like it was a, uh, a work of the devil. It just gripped her again, and she couldn't handle it. So uh, that night, <clears throat> obsessed, she knew she had to tell somebody. So for the first time, she told her husband. Well, her husband was a good Christian. And when he heard the story, he thought, my, that happened years and years ago. Uh, surely God's forgiven you. And he said, if you're looking for me to forgive you, I know you to be my faithful and true wife and the mother of our children, and I love you. Forget it. Let's go on. Well, how much better could it be? Everybody forgives her. Everybody loved her. Everybody cared. But she still would not forgive herself. A few days went by, and the thing roared within her again. What was she doing by telling all these people? You say, well, she's making herself right with God. Not at all. You say she's getting right with God. Not at all. You know what she was doing? She was punishing herself. Instead of giving it to Christ and his cross, she's punishing herself. Now, I know most Christians think, well, it's good to get it out in the open. Good to make it right. If you want my personal feeling, the last thing Jimmy Swagger should have ever done was what he did that Sunday morning. Because Christianity is going to be mocked for years to come over what he did then. You know what he did then? He punished his own guilt. He'd have done better if he'd have gone to a desert, made the thing right with God, and walked out of that desert clean than to have unloaded that on all of humanity. Because to this day, I see tabloids, and they've even got postcards now with his face on it with those tears flowing. They got a mechanical postcard that when you open it up, there's his face, and when you move it back and forth, tears flow, making mockery of it. I'm going into this to tell you how awful guilt and condemnation is. And you telling me doesn't resolve one thing. You making things right with me doesn't resolve one thing. If you don't go to Calvary and put that on the one who bore all our sins and transgressions and see that that is something he bore on the cross and that it was finished there and walk away from it forgiven, all you're going to do is punish yourself by dumping it on everybody you come in contact with. And there are professional dumpers. I've had them to come to church, and I've had them in fellowship who just love to tell their trouble, who love to just dump it on everybody. You know what they're doing? They're punishing themselves. They don't realize that. They think, well, I'm getting it right with God. I'm confessing it everywhere we go. 
I didn't what we need. We need you to make it right between you and God and to accept the finished work of Calvary and get up and go on. See, that's what a Christian ought to do. It's first John one and eight and first John two and one. If you sin, you have an advocate with the Father. Take it to the Father. He'll apply the advocate Christ to our Lamb, and he'll forgive you. Get up and go on. But the devil makes a mockery out of guilt and condemnation. Well, back to my story. Finally, this girl couldn't dump it anywhere, and so she wanted to punish herself so bad, she thought, what is it that's brought me into this hell? Uh, I had an affair. What could be the worst thing I could do to my dirty self whom I don't love? Is to have another affair. So she went out to a bar that day and got her a man and went to bed with her, just like that. Went to bed with him. Now the die was cast. There was nobody in the family to tell. There was no God to tell, no church to tell, no husband to tell. They'd all been told, and she still felt guilty. So to punish her guilt, in a few more days, the same thing gripped her, and she went to another bar, got her another man, went to bed with him. It went on like that until it almost was every day. She found somebody to punish her guilt for having an affair in the church years before. Her husband came home from work one day knowing something was wrong, couldn't find her, went out and found her with another man. And because she wasn't doing this, not because she hated her home or family or her husband, she loved them, but because she was punishing this awful guilt, she poured the story out of why she was doing He understood she was in a hysterical condition that night when he put her to bed, but instead she attempted suicide. He caught her before she bled to death, rushed her to the hospital, hospital sedated her and wrapped her wrist or whatever it was, and now she stood before me. She was so sedated, she didn't even know where she was. So I said to the family, I said, look, I can't, I've got to talk to her. I've got to try to help her. I've got to get through to her. The Lord will help us. We had prayer, and I said, bring her back in the morning. Give her a good night's sleep. Bring her back in the morning. And we'll begin counseling. Well, the family took her home, put her to bed. And since they'd come in from out of town, obviously they were having fellowship and talking and having a good time, eating and drinking and so forth, like families do. And around about midnight, one of them went in to check her. She had successfully killed herself and had bled to death. Sad story. That's the other side of guilt and condemnation. There are very few people that are in her position, a small percentage of humanity. But all humanity is in a direction of that kind of crisis. Because we're all trying to do something about the bad feelings we have. The awfulest time I had in a hell I went through was what to do with guilt and condemnation. How to punish. That's when I come to see I was in Christ. And Christ was in me. And whatever anybody thought or said, Calvary had covered my sin. That's the greatest lesson you'll learn in Christianity. Because the second crisis every believer goes through is they cannot live this Christian life within themselves. They can't live it. But to punish ourselves is horrible. And that's why Romans 8 and 1 sticks out so greatly. Actually, Romans 8 and 1 doesn't have anything to do with the rest of the chapter talking about the new man. It talks about the, the old man syndrome, sickness that's still in the mind. That's guilt. That's guilt. 
Nobody does evil and wrong who is in their right mind without shared conscience. Conscience. Nobody does it without guilt. It's just that the longer you do it, the less guilt you feel. Conscience becomes shared. But before God, you still stand guilty and always will until sin is delivered to Christ who paid the price on the cross. So there is no guilt or condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Now that's not a license for all the little petty things you want to do and you think somebody don't want to let you do them. So you're just going to do them anyhow. I think it's much deeper than that because we're talking about a believer's whole relationship with God in Romans 7. We're talking about the fact that in Romans 7, they have such an attraction to the past husband, the old man. Their mind is so tuned to him that when Christ becomes their life, their mind doesn't switch from that tune so quickly. It fits. They have security from that old tune that was played, and they want to dance to it, that spiritual adultery. We want to go back to the way we used to think and used to do. And, of course, that breeds this guilt and condemnation. But once it gets a hold of you that you're in Christ and Christ is in you, then there is no more guilt and condemnation. To every one of you in this room, any guilt and condemnation you have is not because you have done evil or wrong and are paying for it. It's because your thinking is wrong. You don't know who you are. Well, if the devil could trick you in any way at all, the way he would trick you would be to tell you that you're really not who you think you are. You wouldn't be doing what you're doing. So I've got to go back to the simple gospel. It isn't what you do that makes you who you are. It's what he did. Yeah. It isn't what you do today that makes you who you are. I hear somebody all the time say, well, I wasn't a very good Christian today. That's just verbalizing. That's just talk. That's not reality at all because you can't change who you are by what you do. Are you listening to me? You can't change who you are in Christ by what you do. And I've got to throw one of my favorite verses in on this. That's Galatians 6.15. That there is neither condemnation, no, there is neither circumcision nor uncircumcision. There is neither condemnation nor no condemnation in Christ Jesus. There's neither good or bad. Neither one of them matters. Neither righteousness nor evil matters on our part. Then what matters? The new creature, Christ Jesus. That's all that matters. And see, that's what we forget. And that's why I add that word no to Romans 8 and 1, because it's not just you saying doctrinally, yes, we're all in Christ Jesus. You are in Christ Jesus, but you're not free of guilt and condemnation unless you know that. See? Multitudes of believers are in Christ Jesus, but are full of guilt and condemnation, and therefore stay under a law to try to appease that guilt and condemnation. Why? you feel a whole lot better when you keep a law. I mean, a guy may be out here uh, stealing hubcaps, but if he stops at the red light, he feels a whole lot better about stealing hubcaps. Why? He kept the law. He didn't keep it all, but he feels good about himself. Yep, I stopped at the red light. What more you want me to do? See? That's the way our reasoning is. So we think if we keep a little bit of law, it's okay. 
I love what Paul says there. Neither you doing good nor you not doing evil matters to God. It doesn't matter. In other words, God would say to the fellow, hey, it don't matter if you stopped at this red light. You might as well run it. You're breaking laws anyhow. So keeping one law is not going to save you. But keeping one law makes you feel better about yourself. Yes, sir. That's why we have Galatians 6 and 15. Paul said, I don't want you running around feeling better about yourself. What did they have in the church then? Well, they had some folks that kept a bunch of law. Uh, the Jew, Judaizers kept three laws. They were circumcised. They kept the law of the ceremonies and the holy days, and they kept the law of food. Best they could. They kept just three laws. There were 640 in the Torah, but they kept three of them. Why did they do that? Made them feel good. Why we're not so guilty? Look at here. We're keeping the law. Look at who we are. We're the law keepers. I'm going to tell you something. Most of you are free of this here, but I'm going to tell you so you'll never forget it. You know why a lot of people go to church? Why it's hard to keep them from going to church on Sunday, at least every once in a while? See, they condemn us because I'm facing this around the country now. I have four Sundays where we have groups now that are month of Sunday meetings. This is my church here. This is our church here. And it doesn't even meet on Sunday, but it's still our it's our, it's our month of Monday meeting, but still church. This is church for us here in Yakima. And you know, people can't get free enough to say this is church. I talked to a lady yesterday, and she said, oh, it's so good to worship the Lord once a month and, and uh, uh, to, to, to come to the meeting and to have this fellowship. And I said, well, don't you say it? You went to church. <laughs> It was hard on her because she had building program and preacher all fixed up as to this being church. This is church here. Right now it's church. Two or three gathered in his name constitute Christ. This is Christ's body. This is Christ's body at worship, at study, at honor to God. This is church. You know why most people go to church? To appease their guilt and condemnation. And when they don't do it, they feel real bad about it. Now they've broken every other law in the book. But that's the visible law they're going to keep. They're out stealing hood caps every day, but they're going to stop at red light. Why? Everybody sees them there. Why? Well, I might get arrested. Maybe a cop watching. See, so you have to be careful about that. Because in Christ, doing good doesn't matter. Not doing evil doesn't matter. Then you say, what in the world matters if God doesn't want us good? And he's not interested in us stopping evil either. What is it he's interested in? Being that person that's in you. Christ, the new creation. That's what he wants you to be. Well, there's not many of us like that. You're right. We haven't had that gospel. That's where the move of God is. The fellow asked me uh, this weekend. He said, is there a move of God going on? I said, there sure is. The greatest we've ever had in the Reformation Church. We'll find out who we are in Christ. First time we'll find out who we are in Christ. It's a great move of God. But you know, it's just settled down here and there, and a few here and a few there. But that's way of a great move of God. So the interest of the Lord in your life is not you doing better as much as it is you recognizing who you are by Christ in you. And you're going to stumble and fall. And, and here in Romans 8, we're going to study uh, the process by which God expects you to overcome that stumbling and falling when we get to the subject of adoption. But we're not quite ready for that yet, and we're just talking now about the first verse in Romans 8, and we're certainly not going to talk about every verse in Romans 8 like we have this first one. That would be forever in Romans 8. But uh, this is something that I couldn't pass. You have to see the importance of knowing that you're in Christ because that's the only thing that stops you punishing yourself and others and freeing you from guilt and condemnation.